movie, The Life of Pi, has just come out, but we have Kasim Patel, also known as Pi, from Yon Martel's The Life of Pi. Thank you for joining us today, but tell us a little bit about this story for our viewers who haven't read it yet. Hi, well, as you all know, I'm Pai Patel. I grew up in Pondicherry, India, and I grew up with my mom, my dad, and my older brother, whose name was Robbie. Um, I was I was pretty ordinary, I would say, a normal child growing up in poverty-stricken India. Uh, but my father owned a zoo, so we made off by that. Um, I grew up practicing Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, but it was all, I grew up practicing that by myself. My family did not um, participate in the religious and just spiritual things I was concerned with. So life was going pretty well, I would say, and my father decided to pack up our bags and move to Canada. So we packed up our bags. We, um, I don't believe in that. Yeah, yeah, we moved to Canada and we didn't actually get there. <coughs> I'm, sorry, I'm really sorry. Um, because the boat had some complications with it and my family passed away. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. It was devastating and I ended up on a raft with my, an orangutan, a, a Bengal tiger, um, a hyena. And a zebra. And I don't want to spoil the rest of the novel for anyone out there who hasn't read it yet. I definitely suggest going to read it. Um, it is a very interesting story. I see you have your notes there. I have mine too. Um, I just want to say that you have an amazing story. But um, a lot of people find it very controversial. Um, one topic of discussion. Um, is that you've upset many animal organizations that are against your views on animals and zoos. In the beginning of your novel, you say one might even argue that if an animal could choose with intelligence, it would opt for living in a zoo since a major difference between a zoo and the wild is the absence of parasites and image and the abundance and scarcity in the second. And um, I think we have two very excited members from the audience who really want to talk about this with you. Love to. Uh, so uh, we're going to get to that right after this break. Okay, and we're back. We have two very avid readers, Sydney and Cheyenne, who have very important questions for Mr. Pie. Thank you, girls, for coming. Thank you. Sydney, you can start. Okay. Um, do you believe that zoos are a better place for animals than their natural habitat? Because I'm an animal activist, and I strongly believe that animals should be kept in the wild. I definitely respect your opinion. I'm sure that a lot of you out there have um, questions really similar to that. But to me, religion and zoos face very similar problems. Um, certain illusions about freedom plague them both. That's a quote from chapter one. Um, I mentioned religion because the majority of the world practices some form of religion. Many people would say that it restricts people from being open-minded and creative. When in fact, in my, in my life, religion allows me um, to be creative and open-minded through storytelling. So many people would say that zoos infringe upon the rights of animals, their freedom, when in reality, animals aren't very free in the wild. So in the wild, animals have to constantly fight to survive, where in the zoo, they are fed and taken care of. Um, they have to overcome many obstacles that predators and humans create for them, um, poachers, that kind of thing. And in zoo enclosures, the, the familiar territory allows them to fulfill two imperatives, the avoidance of enemies and the getting of food and water. So instead of having to go risk their lives hunting for food, tigers, for example, they um, they sneak up on their prey. Instead of that, their food their, and the animals that they eat comes to them in buckets. So, um, 
So I'm not necessarily saying that zoo enclosures are better than the wild, but I do believe that they are safer for the animals who live there. Wow. I think that's very interesting, your views on zoos and everything like that. Um, in the novel, you personify um, animals a lot, and I think that's what Cheyenne's question about. Is that right? Yes. Um, I actually have notes here for you guys. Wow, everyone's so prepared today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I really think that your views on zoos are really interesting, and uh, I thank you for clearing up that previous question because I am an animal activist myself. Um, you also give humans animalistic traits, so I was wondering, do you believe that humans are animals or animals are like humans? Okay, so that's a great question. A lot of people ask me that all the time. Really? Yeah. Um, when my family still owned the zoo, my father had painted on a wall in bright red letters the question, do you know which animal is the most dangerous animal? An arrow pointed to the small curtain, and behind it was a mirror. This, you can also read this in chapter one of the novel. But I always laugh at the expressions on people's faces after finding out that they are the most dangerous animals in the zoo. I, wow. humans, did you know that humans have actually caused more damage to animals in the zoo than animals have to themselves when they close? Um, I remember reading stories about a shoebill dying of shock after its feet was smashed with a hammer. Um, I actually, at my dad's zoo, a monkey's arm was broken after reaching for pro-offered nuts. A zebra was stabbed with a sword, and there are so many other assaults on animals that I could talk to you all day. I mean, walking sticks, umbrellas, hairpins, knitting needles, scissors, whatever you can think of that people can sneak into the zoo. They can harm animals with them, which to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you pay to get into the zoo and then you're going to harm the animals that live there. But I remember thinking about how savage and cruel humans are um, while reading and hearing about the things that they do. My dad would come home with stories all the time. And so humans will tell you, they'll tell you all the time, that animals are vicious or bloodthirsty, or they can say they're friendly and cute, whatever perception of animals they have, but they don't realize that we, when we're looking at animals, we're looking in the mirror because we ourselves are animals. So, just like in everyday life, this is true because humans, we don't have to survive every day when put in hostile in dangerous situations, we become uncivilized and have many animal-like qualities. So, I believe that humans um, are more like animals than we would like to admit. Animals aren't exactly like humans, but humans are. That is very interesting. Wow, you ladies have brought some very, very good questions. I'm sure lots of our readers out there had themselves. Um, thank you for coming, and um, we'll continue this interview right after the break. about animals before the break, um, but speaking of animals, you were trapped on a lifeboat with a 450-pound bingo tiger. Um, I believe we have a caller on line one who would like to know more about that. Great. Let's hear it. Hi, you're on with the Sydney Show. Hi, Sydney. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. I have a question for Pi about his relationship with Richard Parker. Okay, awesome. Sure. Caller, can I ask what your name is real quick? Oh, my name is Shaniqua from Compton. Oh, nice to Thank you, you Shaniqua, for calling in. Yeah, that's really nice to meet you. So, without Richard Parker, I wouldn't be alive today to tell you my story. And that was in Chapter 2. Uh, he pushed me to go on living. I would like to say that Richard Parker loved me as much as I loved him. But I'm not so sure that he did. Taking care of Richard Parker gave me reason to keep on going, keep on fighting for both of our lives. I, for that, I'm very thankful, and he will always have a really special place in my heart. 
Um, the reason why I asked about your relationship with Richard Parker is because many people think that you are Richard Parker. When you told the human version of your story, people associated the French cook with the hyena, the Chinese sailor with the zebra, and the orange juice with your mother. The only animal left from the boat to be accounted for is Richard Parker, which many people assume to be you. I struggled with this theory personally because I don't really think that you are Richard Parker because you're not similar to each other. In one chapter, you mentioned that you descended to the level of savagery you've never imagined possible. At the end of part three, Richard Parker kills the blind man with a French accent. You mentioned in your human story that you stabbed the French cook in the stomach and ate his liver. The only connection I see you have with Richard Parker is that you both killed other living organisms to survive. I personally believe that Richard Parker is the side of you that allowed you to survive. Richard Parker represents who you had to be in order to survive. In the beginning of the story, you seem like an innocent child. You even said that you always shuddered when you snapped open a banana because it sounded like the breaking of an animal's neck. I see Richard Parker as a side of you that is more savage-like. That explains why Richard Parker left you once you landed in Mexico because you no longer needed Richard Parker in order to survive. You even said at the end of the story that Richard Par Parker is hiding somewhere you'll never find him. How could you be so sure that Richard Parker is hiding somewhere? That leads me to believe that you are hiding the Richard Parker side of your personality within yourself. Sorry for the long comment. I'm just a big fan of your book. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing and calling in, Shaniqua. That's a really interesting theory. I can I can definitely see how you and probably many other people came to that conclusion. Do you think my theory is correct? Your theory is your theory. Um, I can't say if it's true or not. If you believe you're correct, then I believe you're correct. That's awesome. Thank you, Shaniqua. All right. I'm a big fan of the novel, so of course I had my own question. Um, forgive me, I wrote it down on my phone the other day when I was um, I'm just sitting on the couch. All right. I know you have to leave soon, so um, this is my question. Which story is the real story? I really want to believe that the animal story is correct, but everything doesn't seem to like make sense. It's kind of interesting how Richard Parker left you before anyone could discover the both of you on the on the uh, beach. I would think that Richard, Richard Parker would naturally stay with you since he depended on you. Uh, to keep him alive for several months. Um, in the animal version of the story, there was a blind man with a French accent that tried to kill and eat you. The part of the story that caught me completely off guard because it seemed very random that you would meet another person in the same condition as you in the middle of the ocean. You, When you mentioned the French cook being on board on the lifeboat with you in the human version of the story, I figured that was the man who tried to eat you in the animal story. I come to the conclusion that you made up the animal story in order to cope with the harshness of your situation. As much as I would like to believe the animal story, I, I just can't. So it's so crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, I would just say that whatever you believe, that whatever you choose to believe, that you should just go with it. Um, that's the whole point of everything, really. Just believe in what you want. Wow. I mean, I'm sure that's going to leave a lot of readers unsatisfied, but it is a good chance for them to really take the novel for what it is. Thank you so much for being on the show. I had a and uh, stay tuned because next we're making a Caesar salad. <laughs> <laughs>